In this episode of the Houndsman XP podcast, Steve flies solo on the mic uh, with a good friend, Arnold Nubbin Moore. Steve and Arnold, uh, Steve and Nubbin have been friends for decades. They've traveled the country over together, hunting these hounds, going to events, and you're going to hear all about their relationship. But I'm going to sit this one out. Uh, Steve caught up with uh, Nubbin as they hunted together in southeast Alabama. So buckle up and sit back and, and just enjoy some good conversation between two old friends and two accomplished houndsmen. Before we get there, I want to draw your attention to our website, houndsmanxp.com. You can find everything you need to know about our um, our team, our members of Lauren Branny, Seth Hall. Steve and I both have our short bios on there so you can know who you're listening to and who's bringing you this content. There's been a lot of questions about what Patreon is. Basically, you can go on our website, find the Patreon link, go to our Patreon page, and you can become a patron, a supporter of the Houndsman XP podcast for as little as $1 per show. By the end of April, we are going to have our initial drawing for our Patreon patrons, and we are rounding up some cool gear for you. It is going to be well worth your time to uh, get in that Patreon page and get signed up as little as a dollar per show. That is going to give you uh, the opportunity 12 times in a year to draw prize packages that are worth up to $100 for our $4 a month patrons. So make sure you're checking that out. We really could use your support. We're going to start adding more and more uh, exclusive content to that Patreon page. So you are going to see things pop up on social media directing you there. And if you're a patron of Houndsman XP signing up on that Patreon page, you're going to get articles. You're going to get uh, uh, exclusive deals on, on gear. You know, anything we can line up for our patrons, that's what we're going to use Patreon for. And again, you can do that for as little as $1 per show. We're talking about two Monster Energy drinks. We're talking about three Mountain Dews. We're talking about, you know, $4 a month gives you the opportunity to, to be a part of the community and share in these exclusive deals that we're going to bring to you by being faithful supporters of Houndsman XP. So hope to see your name pop up soon on, uh, on these Patreon notifications. You can go there and see that you're going to be entitled to Houndsman XP gear that we're going to get shipped out to you right away. And uh, hope to see your name pop up there. We could use your support. Hey, let's listen to uh, two old friends catch up here. In 1969, the company I was working for transferred me to Memphis, Tennessee. After living there a few weeks, <clears throat> I, I met some coon hunters, or I had to find some coon hunters where I could coon hunt. So I joined the Tri-State Coon Hunters Association, and I met Mr. Ed Beard and a few more people. But anyway, Ed is the one I first started hunting with. And so later on that fall, uh, when it was getting September, October, he asked me if I had any vacation left, and I said, yeah. And he said, well, we go to the White River over to Maddox Bay every year around Thanksgiving and, and stay several days, stay a week, and we coon hunt. So I scheduled some vacation, and one time, when it came time to go, we loaded up and went to the White River. Okay, we stayed at Sweat's Fish Camp, and then there I met several other coon hunters that, that I didn't know and come to find out that that was a black and tan reunion. Okay, I, I didn't have black and tan. I had a walker dog and a blue tick dog. Well, anyway, I met Mr. Jarvis Humphreys there. Carl Meinhart was there. Doc Vincent was there. Uh, Jar uh, not Jarvis, but uh, anyway, several others I met there. And then we coon hunted. We started coon hunting. That night we left right at dark. And Mr. Ed, we drove down in the field and got to the woods, and we, we just started walking. And then, you know, we, we was treeing coons. So we, we had caught nine coons by 9 o'clock. And he said, uh, 
more I'm ready to I'm ready to go I'm ready to go back to camp and I thought man I was a young man I said I'm just getting started we need to hunt some more he said we're gonna hunt all week so anyway we go to the camp and so when we get there I asked him I said is there any place I can walk from here and just go hunting by myself he said yeah he said just go right up this Maddox Bay here and turn the dog loose so I did and she struck a track, and first thing she, first thing I know, she crossed Maddox Bay and treed over there. There was no way I could get to her. So I just go back to the camp and leave her treed. That's all I could do. And with the next morning when I got up, she was laying out there in the yard. So anyway, that was the first, first trip to Maddox Bay. We caught several coons that week. I, I've got some pictures at home that, uh, that we took on the porch the next day. Uh, after a, several days of hunting, we had a bunch of coons piled up on the porch. So anyway, I, ma- I made made some pictures with my walker dog and a blue tick dog, but that was my first trip to Maddox Bay. You're listening to my buddy Nubbin Moore uh, talking about his first experience hunting the White River National Wildlife Refuge in uh Arkansas, something that he and I have uh, done together now for 10 years. Nubbin, uh, we've had some good hunts out there at White River, haven't we? We have. We've freed a few coons, had some good nights, and had some bad ones, but that's the way coon hunting goes. (laughs) Yes, we have, yeah. Well, my first experience with going out there was hunting with you, of course, and uh, you told me uh, about it, and... uh, that first year, we didn't get off to a very good start, did we? No, we didn't. It's too much water, too much water. Well, that's the problem out there in the White River. You know, it drains from all up the up the Mississippi Basin up the, through there, and uh, we're on the Arkansas side in what's called the Arkansas Delta. But uh, the, you had an uh, for several years you hunted out there with Mr. Fred Sanders. Tell me a little bit about our uh, your relationship with Fred and how you met and how the two of you became friends and a little bit about Fred. Well, Fred Sanders, after I hunted with Mr. Beard for a while, uh, you know, I met Fred, and Fred and I started hunting, and he was more my type for the way I like to hunt. So I quit hunting with Mr. Beard and started spending my weekends and a couple of times during the week with, with Fred Sanders. Fred had black and tan hounds, which I did not have. And uh, But anyway, Fred was a little guy. He was a little older than me, but uh, Fred liked to hunt. And, you know, I remember one time we, we, we didn't have a shocking collar, and he told me, he said, uh, you know, we need to save up our money and buy a shocking car. So we started every time we'd go hunting, we'd both up ante up and water up three or four dollars, five, ten, whatever we had to spare, we'd put it in the pot. So we finally got enough to buy us a shocking car. <laughs> bought, bought it from Bill Boatman. He used to be, have, have a place to, you know, buy hunting supplies. So anyway, but Fred was Fred was a good hunter. Fred Fred was a maintenance man. Uh, it uh, it well he was in business for himself to start with, and then he got, went to the work for First Tennessee Bank as a maintenance man. But Fred was a good hunter. Fred liked to hunt. <laughs> <laughs> what I remember about Fred was, of course, Fred was already in his eighties when I uh, first went out to White River. I don't know how old was Fred that first year. You think mm-hmm. ten years ago? Ten years ago, he would have, he would have been in his late seventies or early eighties. Early eighties, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, <laughs> I've always enjoyed taking the camera to the hunt, or whenever I'm pleasure hunting and all. I like to play back the videos and and relive uh, the hunt. And I got in the habit of posting our hunt pictures on Facebook for the other guys, mainly just for the guys in our party that went out there and had such a good time every year and and uh, we <laughs> we would uh, be getting ready to go and what would Fred say <laughs> yeah he would he would say we're already treated two or three coons if hadn't finished this damn movie shoot <laughs> <laughs> that's right 
he called it a movie shoot, yeah. and uh, he he thought that that was just a waste of time. Uh, Mr. Fred was was not the most patient guy in the world, was he? No, he wasn't. He was. He'd get excited. He really would, and he'd get mad sometimes too. But uh, but he was a, <laughs> he, he he was a good man. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I know that you and him were great friends, and uh, that's the thing about this coon hunting sport is the friendships that you make that make it worthwhile. Uh, Nubbin and I have been friends uh, since our days at UKC. We both worked for UKC. Uh, for, uh, Nubbin as a field rep when I was there in the Coonhound Department, and uh, uh, we we have just really enjoyed it. As we're recording this, we're we're sitting uh, in a, on a beautiful uh, February afternoon here in Sweet Home, Alabama. Where are we, Nubbin? Uh, we're in southeast Alabama. I think we're in Macon County. It's either Lee or Macon County is where we're at now. So yeah, we're here as uh, guests of uh, some of your friends from back mm-hmm. around Birmingham, right? right? That's right. Jerry Hanna, Mr. Jerry Hanna's down here in Percy, or Raymond Wright is his name. Everybody knows him as Percy. But uh, he invited us to come down here and hunt three days with him. So that's what we're doing down here. Yeah, and we've had a pretty good hunt, haven't we? We yeah. have. We have. Yeah, I know on Thursday night, uh, our first night, uh, we uh, it rained all day, pretty much all day, and there was a lot of water out there. And thought maybe we'd get rained out for the first night. We'd planned this hunt. When did we plan it? Back at it, when it, was it, it White River? Or? Well, it was either around White River or or the first of the year. We started talking about some other place to go hunting. Yeah, yeah. Well, we decided not to go to Batesville, Mississippi, this year for the UKC Winter Classic. We usually get a cabin out there on Sardis Lake and have a good time, just uh, you know, kind of camping out there for a few nights and. Uh, uh, but in, uh, in a nice cabin, but uh, we kind of forego went that this year. I think you had a uh, maybe a birthday celebration or something. But we decided to come down here to. Uh, I see one, a couple of the other hunters are rolling in here. We're gonna hit this thing at dark thirty mm-hmm. here tonight for the third night. But uh, anyway, uh, glad we came down. We've had a good time. Oh yeah, we treat we treat uh, well. We got two coons Thursday night and three last night. And, and of course, Jerry's like me. Steve mentioned the birthday. Yeah, I turned seventy nine here a week or so ago, and uh, so after a couple of hours of hunting, Jerry and I both about the same age. We're ready to quit, so we came in <laughs> like we quit last night about ten o'clock. Yeah, we were hunting. Uh, the roads were pretty bad, cut up and muddy, and it was a little bit uh, of an ordeal there. We had to winch one of the side by sides out. We got high centered, but that's all fun, you know. We've uh, we've had a little bit to eat. We haven't eaten much, have we? Now we we've <laughs> way too much. <laughs> I'm supposed uh, to be on the diet, but I think I have earned the diet this week. Yeah, well, that's all. What stays in hunting? What happens in hunting camp stays in hunting camp, right? That's right. We won't tell the ladies when that's we right. get home what yeah. we ate. Yes, yeah, right. they don't need to know everything. Do they? <laughs> that's right. That's for sure. Hey, boy, last night I was kind of impressed with the dog work we had. Uh, uh, tell a uh, tell the listeners about your little Walker female that you're hunting right now. Okay, I got a four-year-old Walker female. She weighs about fifty pounds, and she's out of insane cane, and and I really don't know what the bottom side is. Uh, but anyway, she's a nice little dog, little nice tree dog. And last night we turned loose and cruised Steve's dog, open first and started trailing, and she put in with him, and they went around to the left and circled around about two hundred and eighty yards. And I told Steve, I said, mine's treeing. And he said, well, Cruz is not. So anyway, Cruz went on. Mine stayed there. And we walk in there and have a raccoon. And 
Steve's dog went on in there two or three hundred more yards. He's actually about uh, about four fifty from where she was, I think. Yeah, Cruz was. Yeah. 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 So I'm thinking, you know, we're going to get a double here. It's time of year. The coon are rutting and, you know, kind of running together. And In my intuition, I'm thinking, well, Kate's got the sow. She's went right up a tree right there. And old Cruz, he's got the, he took the big boy on, on through the country. And a couple of the fellows went with me and brought a, a gun along because uh, if he did finish that track, I was going to reward him with the coon. And uh, the more we, of course, he was treeing hard and yours was treeing every breath. Kate's a real tree dog. And the closer I got that tree, I'm thinking, you know, I bet that thing is in a den tree. Uh, and that's exactly what I had was a den tree. So you kind of put it on me there. Oh, well. Blind hog picks up acre and every now and then. <laughs> yeah, that that was good seeing her fall off that track, and it was a pretty good <coughs> track, you oh, know. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was a running track, yeah. Yeah, and she just fell out of it, tree. Man, that's that's the way to do it. But uh, then the next track we got was pretty bad track, kind of a feat. Well, we uh, we turned Jerry uh, Jerry's two dogs loose. Uh, they're a pair of dogs. Are they litter mates? Yeah, they are. They're litter mates. Yeah. And uh, his bow dog and his uh, Roxanne female. Mm-hmm. and They went on a tour. I think they went four or 500 yards yeah, back they, into they were there. About, about 550, I think. And just kind of, say. I think they just kind of fell treed off mm-hmm. uh, back in there. And we drove around and got around on the back side of the property and... Uh, and they were treed and went in there, and there was a real live raccoon up that tree. So, there was. Yeah. So that was all good. And then the next track we got was a feed track that all just right. kind of was tough going. They they really worked hard, and that was just Kate and, and Cruz again. And uh, I don't know how far they went all together on that track, but they ended up finally circling back and come back almost to the buggies. And mm-hmm. Came real close. Well, first, they went about four or 500 yards and then circled around to the left. And then yeah. came, came up a little ditch bank or a little drain or something. And Yeah. Well, anyway, without boring everybody about our coon hunting stories, everybody out there that follows hounds has, fought, has got a story to tell about their most recent hunt and uh but anyway that track that old bad feed track they come up short on that i but we were kind of glad i was uh, jerry said that they were getting into a bad place if they crossed the road and went on a in there so i guess it was just as well and then oh, uh, yeah then we had uh, one more track there that uh that was the last one we kind of let Kate slip out of the box, so it was Kate and Roxanne and and Bo on that one, and that was a pretty short track, wasn't it? Oh yeah, they struck and they didn't run very far, and but they wasn't but 150 yards when they treed, so that was a real quick one. We I found another raccoon. Yeah, and uh, so anyway, that finished up a nice night for sure, and we've got looks like. Probably the best night weather-wise that we've had will be tonight. Mm-hmm. Right now, the temperature outside's about 56 degrees, and we're at, uh, oh, I don't know, about 4.30 in the afternoon. So uh, we'll get in there and get something to eat in a minute. But I uh, wanted to talk about your background in coon hounds, uh, Nub, and you started out as a kid there hunting around not very far from where you live right now. Isn't that right? That's right. Same little neighborhood. And you're just outside of Birmingham, Alabama. Yep. I'm southeast of Birmingham, about 25 miles. Sterrett, Alabama. Sterrett, Alabama. Sweet home, Alabama. Yep. Well, <clears throat> talk about a little bit about what it was like to be coon hunting back there as a kid. Did you start out when you were real young? Oh, yeah. What? I was a teenager, and my neighbor, my friend that I went to school with, uncle had a red dog, it was a tree of coon, so we used to walk over to his house and take old, his name was Rock, and we'd take him out and walk from the house and take an axe with us, and we'd go coon hunting. If we treed one, 
we'd just chop the tree down and catch him. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what we did for several years. Yeah. And then... You carried a gun, too, though, didn't you? No, we didn't no, have a didn't gun. didn't have a gun. No, huh? we didn't have a gun. We just took a double-bitted axe with us. What kind of illumination device did you have back in those days? We had a carbite light. We had a carbite light. And we all had one. Had to carry a little carbite way and a little water bottle where you can put water in it. And, <laughs> and that's what we used for light for many years, yeah. for a good long while. You didn't ever use any of those alternate sources for water, did you? Uh, I had to a time or two. <laughs> One, if I'd climb a tree to try to shake a coon out, then I may have to use that alternate source of water. <laughs> it didn't smell too good. <laughs> no, I imagine it didn't. Well, the, I remember an old story the guys tell about the guy that and uh, supposedly this happened back in West Virginia where I grew up. Fellow was uh, they treated the coon in a den tree, and of course they were trying to get it out. Back in those days, they didn't a coon treed. You know, they didn't know anything about this treed and freed idea. They wanted to get that coon, mm -hmm. so they somebody said, "Well, just." Uh, Get, take some of that carbide and wrap it up in a handkerchief and put some water on it and drop it down in that den tree and that fumes, you know, that acetylene gas. That'll run that old coon out of there. Dropped it down in there, you know, and the coon wasn't coming out. So the old boy decided he'd look down in the hole to see <laughs> if the... The coon was in there, and he had that, his carbide light on, and he ignited all that gas, and it blew him clear back off the tree. I don't <laughs> doubt it. That stuff's dangerous. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it. Uh, I used that too. You know, we've mm -hmm. talked about it on this podcast. I think back in the day, you know, when you dump out the the what we called the slack, mm -hmm. that carbide that just turned white kind of to a white powder light and you'd have to open it up the the bottom of it and dump out the carbide and put you some fresh in That's right. and you could always tell if somebody had been hunting up that hollow by those little white piles of carbide laying along the path you know and those were the good old days so what was coon hunting beside beyond that i mean you had plenty of territory to hunt oh yeah we had uh I belonged to a hunting club after I got 16 and joined the thing. Then I went off to the Navy, and, and when I came back in 64, um, my buddy Ronnie Wortham and I uh, bought a dog, and we started coon hunting. And of course, we got better light. We bought us a wheat light and started with that. And, and What's then, a wheat light? A wheat light is a... It's a wheat light. <laughs> it's a wheat light. It's a wheat light. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I grew up in, well, Birmingham around where you were was coal mining country right. around yeah. in there, too. Yeah. Anybody yeah. that's raised up in the coal mining areas mm -hmm. know that those wet cell uh, batteries, four volt batteries, are made by Kohler Manufacturing mm -hmm. up in Massachusetts. And that's what they used in the mines. And, uh, uh, had a cord, a heavy duty cord on it, a little four volt bulb, and and that was a a huge step up from a carbide light, oh, wasn't yeah. it? It's like going to town. We was uptown then. <laughs> Think about a wheat light, so those batteries would leak that acid out of them and eat your clothes up. Eat the eat the rear end out of your car hard overalls. <laughs> eat the upholstery off your seats. <laughs> That's what yeah. battery actually does. That's exactly what it was. Yeah, yeah for for sure. Well, so, uh, but you didn't have a lot of coon back then, did oh, you? Oh, no, we didn't have. If we, if we trade one coon, we thought we was doing good, and then we'd, we'd probably be half the mm -hmm. night doing that. Did you skin them, sell the furs? No, no, I didn't ever do that. I did it some later on in life, you know, some later on when the hides got a little more, but, you know. We, did y'all bring them home and tack them on the barn or anything? No, or? we I never did do that. We now we'd bring some home, and I remember we took one home one time, and we were spending the night with Robert Gardner, and uh, we come in about daylight and throw the old big old boar cone on the back porch, and sometime after lunch, 
His dad come in and woke us up, said, you boys get up, said, I've got that cone cooked, we're going to eat. So I go into the <laughs> table, and there was a pile of meat in the center of the table, so we all started eating, and he said, Nubbin, did you like that cone? And I said, well, it tastes pretty good. And he said, well, that's not cone. I said, well, what is it? He said, that's goat. He said, I killed a goat. <laughs> I thought I was eating cone, but I was eating barbecued goat. Well, which which would you have, at that point, would you have rather been eating? It, 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 you know, any, anything you barbecue tastes as good as the sauce, so it really <laughs> don't matter what That's it is right. if you got good sauce. That's right. I agree. I agree. It's all in the sauce, mm-hmm. isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Well, I know when I was a kid, we lived out in the Boot Hill area of Missouri. Well, actually, right along the river in Charleston. And my dad talked about barbecue and goat and how good it was. And uh, I uh, I never experienced that till I went in the Air Force and was stationed in San Angelo, Texas. And out there, they would uh, butcher these uh, Angora goat kids you know and then get a quarter or whatever off of one of those and barbecue it over mesquite uh wood you know and uh, man that was good i figured out that barbecue goat was pretty good to eat mm, that tastes good i remember that yeah well did uh, uh what about uh the dogs you had back then do you remember any of those early dogs? Oh, yeah. The first dog we had uh, when I got out of the Navy running, I went up and heard it was a black female for sale. So we go up and we talking to this man about the dog. He won $75 for her, so we bought her. And he said, if you boys will buy that black dog, I got a blue tick here that just she's a little over a year old and said she started. said, I'll just give her to you. So we we give the man seventy five dollars and went home and now where'd you get the seventy five dollars? Man, I don't remember. That's been a long time ago, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we hard work, you know, huh? You know, I got a job, went to work, and he was working. I got and, you. Okay. Uh, so we had we had a dollar or two anyway. It didn't have much, but anyway, mm-hmm. we scraped up seventy five dollars. So anyway, after hunting a dog for a, a month, we decided that the blue tick was better than the old black dog. So we sold her for and got her $75 back. So we had a free dog, and she turned out to be a real good dog. And uh, and after a year, I bred her one time and had had a pup, and I kept a pup, and then she got ran over on the road and killed one night while we was hunting. So anyway, I had the blue dog, and that's when I moved to Memphis. That's, that's the blue dog that I took to Memphis in 59. Or, yeah, I see. Sixty-nine. Remember anything it. about her breeding, or did no, she have papers? No, she was. The mother was a half black and tan and a half blue tick, and I bred her to a registered blue tick. I remember that. Mm-hmm. And so that's what she was. She was quarter black and tan, I guess. And, uh, well, and at that time, did you have a coon hunters club around there in Shelby County? No, we didn't have one here. We there was one down at Lawley, Alabama. And uh, mm-hmm. my buddy and I went down there and joined that thing before I moved to Memphis. But, you know, we didn't hunt much out of it. But uh, anyway, uh, went to, when I went to Memphis, then I started hunting in the competition. Hunts. And the reason you went to Memphis was because you worked, right? I worked, you, I worked for a company called Chicago Bridge and Iron Company, and they transferred me to Memphis. And uh, I moved up there and stayed six years, and then I asked to be transferred back to Birmingham. So, and that's that's how long I stayed in Memphis, six years. I see. And that's where you met Fred Sanders and yeah. Ed Beard and those oh, yeah. people and got us affiliated with the... Right. Well, at some point in time, was it through Fred that you got your Hank dog? Oh, yeah. Well, he couldn't stand it because I didn't have black dogs. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, he had a dog that was out of Harness's queen... A guy named Harness lived over in Arkansas. Jimmy Harness was his name, and uh, so he had a, a dog that was, I think it was out of one of Jarvis Humphrey's stud dogs, and uh, so I bought a pup, a female pup, out of him. And Fred bought one too. And so when I went to Memphis, to Fred went and got the pup, bought both of them, and brought them to his house. And so I go up back to his house. And, 
He said, my old Hank dog has got a litter of pups down here in the edge of Mississippi. You need to go down there and get one of those. And uh, it was $50. And I think I'd give Jimmy 100 for that other one. And uh, so anyway, I, we'd go down and get that pup. And it was the last pup of the litter. All of them been picked over. That was the last one left. So I brought a, I brought a male and a female black dog back to Alabama with me. And that's how I got started in the black dogs. I see. Uh-huh. Now, what was that related to Hank, or was that uh, Hank, or that, was that that was my Hank dog, one I called Alabama Hank, uh, the one that Fred bred, and uh, the one I got from Jimmy Harness was making a good dog, and but the Hank dog come on it was a better tree dog, and I I made a deer dog out of the female, and my son liked to deer hunt, so and then and then I put my time on Hank as a young dog. I got you. So uh, Hank, uh, for people who may not have heard about him, he was uh, uh, the National Grand Night Champion at Autumn Oaks at at the 25th anniversary hunt in uh, Jasper, Indiana. What year was that? That was in 84. 1984. 1984. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I ever saw you. That's right. That's really the first big hunt I ever went to. I'd been to some small hunts around home, but i never been off to a big hunt. That was the first big hunt I ever went to. Mm-hmm. Well, go back to Hank just a little bit. How did you start him? How did he progress? You know, what was his strengths and all that? Well, you know, when it, when I first started about three or four or five months old, I'd, I'd get a hide or drag and fool with him and hang one up and let him bark at it. And He was a tree dog then, but then... I don't know. He didn't tree his first cone till he was about nine, ten months old, something. And I, my one of my hunting buddies told him, said, "You need to be hunting that female. This this male dog's not going to do nothing." So, but I said, "Yeah, I believe he will." So, anyway, we one night I was hunting with Jamie Perry, and he had a Walker dog, and uh, the 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 dog struck, and they was trailing, and his dog treed, and. Mine never treed before, so he. I heard him go on the tree, and I said, well, you can tree mine, too. And he said, has he been doing that? And I said, that's the first time. <laughs> but <laughs> he, he was a tree dog. I just turned the switch on, and he was a tree dog, ever, you know, ever ever since then. Yeah, describe him. What did he look like, you know? Uh, he, was a, he was a black and tan. Of course, he was black, okay, but he he had light tan, Uh he didn't have big ears. He was a little short-eared dog, not real short, but not like one of the long-eared dogs. But in the, anyway, he had a chop mouth, ball on track, and a chop on tree, and had a real good locate. Anybody could call him. And uh, But he was real fast on track. He could really move a track. But, you know. Yeah. Is that... Uh, uh, what it, was his strength in the hunts? you think well, uh, well when you turned him loose he didn't go out here and go to peeing and carrying on he just took off wide open going hunting and mm-hmm. i'd got to jump on a lot of casts by him getting on in there and get struck and sometimes get treed before they was even getting in there but but he would he was a good he was a go hunting dog he would get in there well that uh that's the way they like them nowadays. The older I get, the less I like that myself. Oh, oh yeah, me too. I, I tell <laughs> some of them now, if they get over 350 yards, I'm ready to call them back. <laughs> that reminds me of Fred. You know, yeah. he, Fred would get a little excited if they got too far oh, out yeah. there, didn't Yeah, he? that's right. He didn't like it. I, maybe, you reckon that was why he uh, wanted that shocking collar? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we bought the thing. <laughs> I don't remember what all we done with it, but then, you know. There was a story you told me about you and Fred one time in the horse <laughs> at yeah, the White yeah, River. Yeah, we was going to the White River in November, and uh, he said, uh, you know, we need a, we need us a pack horse to tie all these coons on, and we can ride it, and we can put our thermos jug on it and put extra coats. Have a sack or two with some cord, and we can, you know, we can tie them cones around the saddle, and we won't have to carry them things. And so anyway, we bought, he he come up with a little horse. He borrowed it from somebody in a horse trailer. It's a little Welch pony is what it was, a little white horse. 
So we we got on that horse, and we took turns. Both about, of you riding it? No, no. We <laughs> take turns about. Right, he'd ride a while, and then I'd ride a while, and we'd walk in through the woods. And uh, we we had been hunting for three or four hours or something, and we hit a road, and we started back towards the trailer. Well, the the horse, I guess that little horse was tired of all that walking, so it, the horse decided it wanted to go to the trailer. So it started running, and I couldn't stop it. I'd pull its head all the way around to my leg on one side and all the way around to the other side, <laughs> and it was still running, going to the trailer. And I thought, man, if there's a limb hanging down, I'm, I'm going to get hurt. So I decided I'm going to get off of the horse. So I just... <laughs> I slipped out of the saddle and off the back end. I went rolling down that, <laughs> rolling down that road. Finally, Fred come walking down through there, and he said, "Where's the horse?" And I said, "Hell, I don't know. It went down towards the trailer. Maybe it'll be down there when we get there." <laughs> and it was when we got to the trailer. It was standing there, ready to get in. <laughs> That was a, a, literally a rodeo. Huh? It was a rodeo. It, it, well, I could say it's worse than that, but I won't. <laughs> Things got a little west. You know, I thinking back on our White River trips and all, and uh, we were talking just a minute ago, or no, uh, on this trip, maybe yesterday, something about our friend Kenneth Rains. Mm -hmm. Kenneth was quite a colorful guy. I remember the first time that I came to the White River and met Kenneth for the first time. Here's this guy has got this silver hair. I hear old Hoss back there. And he's wanting to, He's not understanding why he's not getting any attention, but uh, I guess that's just background uh, uh, for the podcast. But oh, yeah. anyway, Kenneth was uh, always dressed you know, looked like he'd come out of a Cabela's catalog. Uh, still had a head of hair. And a, as I remember, a little, you know, mustache there. A little goatee, I think mm -hmm. it was. Yeah. He kept all trimmed up and all. But uh, he was our cook, it, it, our breakfast cook pretty much at the camp. But he used to tickle me to death with hunting that black and tan dog he had named Buck. Old Buck, yep. That was him. <laughs> what would he say? He'd holler, look. He'd turn him loose and he'd go, he'd holler, look, look. <laughs> I don't know if the dog understood what look meant anyway. He was mean and look for, like Jerry Clower said, look for him. Yeah, huh? that's what he'd say, look <laughs> for him. <laughs> Old uh, you know, those times are just stuff that you'll never forget, oh, and yeah. they're just the simplest things yep. and and not significant to anybody in any way, not earth-shattering or, or news to anybody, but just the good times oh, yeah. we had that a lot you of had good out, times. sitting around that table telling stories, you know, and, uh, and oh, man, there's a, there's a lot of them out not there. I, I can remember... Uh, you know, it's getting. <laughs> I remember that one night we took the boat down to down Maddox Bay, and it got so foggy we couldn't see coming back. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> that? Oh yeah. Well, I finally had to cut it down just to idling speed, cause man, you couldn't see. You couldn't even hardly see the bank. I got over against the right hand bank, and just stayed where I could see the bank four or five foot over there, and just stayed right on the edge. Because, I mean, if you get turned around with all that fog, you're going to know which way you're going, up or down. Well, the thing about that Maddox Bay area and that White River Refuge is that it gets a lot of water. And at mm -hmm. times, the, the most convenient way to hunt it and really the most enjoyable way is to hunt by boat. Right. I, I enjoy <laughs> hunting by on the boat over there. And, you know, you can cover a lot of ground. We we used a boat just like a truck. We'd just go down to us for 100 yards and stop put the dogs out mm -hmm. and tree a coon, come back to the boat. Steve would always hang out, light up, blinking. And yeah, we got those little strobe lights that we hang up on the limbs. Anybody that's hunting in big timber or areas that you're not familiar with, especially if you're hunting off of a four-wheeler or out of a boat, you can uh, hang that strobe light up. The one that we have particularly is a blue one that really you can see it a long way, since, especially in those flat river bottoms uh, and that big open hardwood timber in the White River area. And uh, it just saves you a lot of time. 
<coughs> I think I've talked myself this weekend up until I'm hoarse, you know. Well, that could be a plus. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be good for the rest of y'all, so you wouldn't have to listen to me, right? Yeah, I couldn't resist it. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know how it is. But uh, well, let's see. We've had, uh, let's talk a little bit about our UKC days, and, and uh, we got acquainted when you became a field rep. Mm-hmm. Uh, we needed somebody down here in Alabama. What? Who was the rep before you came aboard? Uh, I wish you hadn't asked me that. <laughs> All right. I well, I can't it, remember anyway. his name. He was from Ozark. I remember that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I really I can't. I, I, oh, uh, was it C uh, W Watson? C W Watson. C W Watson. Yeah, he's right. the best there is. <laughs> we used to get tickled at at uh, C W about some of his expressions for sure. But mm-hmm. uh, so anyway, back in that day, we were building the UKC World Hunt and trying to, uh, uh, you know, grow it. And uh, uh, it was uh, it was growing and we were enjoying uh, that growth and all. And we had quite a good group of guys that served as field reps. That's right. We had some good ones. And what we would typically do is uh, we'd go uh, these the field reps that was my first job with UKC was working as a as a field rep and uh, uh, but anyway to work the RQEs for regional qualifying events for the how did uh, you have any stories from back in those days well I the one that I really remember is we I was in Ozark one night and this guy got scratched on a cast to come in he was a big old guy and he was mad, but he was really mad because he got scratched. And he come walking in there, hollering and cussing and carrying on. And I thought, what am I going to do, man? This guy's fixing to get on me. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I jumped up and hollered, we'll have none of that. <laughs> and I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> but that calmed him down a little bit. I said, I won't hear another word till." rest of the cast gets in. So you just go over and sit down or go out in your truck, but I'm not talking to you till the rest of the cast comes in. Well, you know, those are those were part of the job was being a peacekeeper. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and knowing the rules. Sometimes it's very hard, too. Yeah, I think the, the biggest strength that a field representative back in those days could have, and we had 15 of them at one time, uh, was their reputation in their area. And if if the field rep was respected and known to be a square shooter, somebody that would listen and uh, knew uh, the rules and knew how to apply them, uh, you know, it could diffuse a lot of situations because a lot of times the guys would come in from the woods and they'd have a head full of steam. You know, they right. figured out that they should have won or their dog should have been scored one way. And uh, the the cast or, or the judge, in this case, we had all non-hunting judges at those RQEs in that's that right. day. That's right. And uh, so being able to diffuse those, those situations. I can remember some of my first experiences. Going, you know, I was working out of southern West Virginia as a field rep, and I worked uh, as far down south as Rogersville, Tennessee. I worked as far north as Jeffersonville, New York. Uh, well, that was my first RQE that I worked up there. And uh, 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 anyway, uh, I remember one night in Ohio, and that was kind of a fa- the fast lane of competition hunting at that time. And there were some good questions that came in that were, some, you know, uh, guys were uh, arguing and that sort of thing. And I just figured on uh, early on that you got to stand your ground, you know, take your position and don't vacillate. You know, don't, once you've made a de- decision, stick by it. And oh, that yeah. was a thing that worked for me uh, real well. Um Tell us a story, and there was an interesting story about uh, 
uh, the world championship one year, and that was uh, at uh, uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. <laughs> that was the year uh, that uh, uh, was probably the longest cast that I remember, and I hear my phone is ringing. And uh, that was, uh, uh, well, rather than me spoil the story, just just start from the beginning. Well, let me set it up this way. We went to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, for the UKC World Championship. Do you remember what year that was, Nubbin? Uh, I do not. Yeah. I do not. But anyway, there was a dog named Nelson's Radar that won it that year. That's one that I do remember that. And uh, to set this up, what we would do with the field reps is we would uh, usually go a night early before the hunt, hunt started, and we'd have a night out with all the guys. And we'd try to pick a nice restaurant to go to and have a good meal, or maybe if there was something... Uh, in the, you know, to do. I remember we went out to, I think it was called Milton, Tennessee, and they had that Cajun country store. Did you go out with us that night out there and listen to that Cajun music and uh, stuff? You think? I think he we don't did. remember. Yeah, I don't huh? remember. Anyway, that was a good time. And then we went into Nashville and we had a steak at the stockyard. I remember going and, there now. Yeah, and we listened to this gal that sang that song, Black Velvet. She was on stage that night. We had a good time. But then, uh, so we had the the world show and all that. We got down to the final cast. And it was on Saturday night, as was the custom then. And you just take it from there. What what did I tell you when before you went to the Well, wood? you told me to come bring back a winner and uh, <laughs> with plus points. Back then, you had to have plus points to win. And I may still do today. I don't know. But anyway, it it gets down, to, long story short, it gets down to there's one dog in the cast, Nelson's Radar. Eddie Parker's handling. And and we, I don't remember exact rules then, but you hunted a while, and if you didn't tree, you just kept, kept hunting because we told you got to have a winner. Do you remember anything about the first part of the hunt that led up? Pretty much no, to the I just point. remember they made some trees and didn't tree a cone. You know, right. all, all of them scratching, and it was down to the radar. So we kept turning the dog loose. Of course, it's getting late, real late. It's getting late. So and it's getting daylight, and we're still out there trying to tree a cone. And we had several reasons why they didn't tree a cone. They got towards the road to catch the dog, two or three different things. But finally, I asked this guy, I said, buddy, if you got a cornfield around here anywhere where there'd be a coon in, if we can tree a coon, it's getting daylight. So we go over and turn loose, and there was a little branch creek going down through there between a, right beside a cornfield. So they turned old radar loose, and he went down there, struck and trailed around, trailed around, and and treed the coon. So it's it's after daylight now. <laughs> so we got plus points. So we come back. And go to the fairgrounds, and most everybody's left by now. Half of the field rep folks had gone to catch an airplane. <laughs> I'm sitting out there. I can remember that there was a white board. I know what fence. he remembered. Where in hell did Nubbin? That's what he remembered. <laughs> there was a white board fence there, and I'm sitting there on that fence waiting. And where in the world? The sun's up. And we've got a world champion cast out there in the woods, and I don't have a clue where they are. Now, remember, there's no cell phones. Right. <laughs> and uh, probably no pay phones either. <laughs> where have you been, Nubbin? He said, well, I did what you told me. I brought you back a dog uh, with plus points, right? I'll never forget that. that was well, they good. changed the rule after that, Steve. You know. it, yeah, yeah. Well... That that's just one of those stories from back in the day. Oh yeah. Do you remember any of the guys that you served with as a field rep? Oh uh, yeah, we had a good crew. We had uh, Jimmy Phillips from Oldham, Georgia. We had Riley Lafoon from Louisiana, and had Gene Hicks from up in Tennessee, and uh, the big guy from up north. What was his name, Steve? Oh, Larry Packey. Uh, Larry Packey was from in Pennsylvania. That, from Pennsylvania, yeah. 
And Lindale Price. Lindale Price from Virginia. Max Summerlin. Oh, Max. I remember Max, first time I saw him, I thought, Steve, where'd you get him? <laughs> <laughs> Max has been a quite a story oh, in yeah. coon hunting, you know. Max, Max wear those glasses, those thick glasses. Mm -hmm. One of the best master hounds in respect. It gets all back to this, uh, Nub, and, and I, I said this before. I know, did you serve with Jim Simpson? Uh, from I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. Somebody told me once. You know, he said, "Steve, I would have a question, maybe that I thought was a legitimate question, at an RQE, but I wouldn't take it back in because I just didn't want to cause Jim that grief <laughs> and that heartburn. He and that's just the kind of respect he had in his community. Mm -hmm. And you know, I can only remember twice." Uh, uh, having to talk to field reps about the job they were doing in a, you know, kind of a uh, serious way. And it was because of of arrogance or not being willing to listen to the hunter, you know. Because when the guy goes out there and pays his money for an entry fee and spent all that time, you know, training his dog and making it that far, whether he's right or wrong, he still deserves to be heard, his story. And uh, as long as he per presents it, I think, in a, in, as a gentleman, you know, and not in an argumentative uh, uh, tone. And uh, But uh, we had very few of those problems, as I recall, you know over the years and uh, do you have you remember any particular other stories about your field rep days no uh, that one particular time i just talked about a few minutes ago is the only time i ever had that i felt threatened you know i've had some you know some arguments with people and you know i just tell them what i thought and what way i was going to rule it and you know if they didn't mm -hmm. like that when well, you know there's there's a form you can fill out and most of the time they would accept you know uh, probably wasn't too happy sometime, but you know, any time you got four hunters and you got a story, they all got a tale. They got really got four different versions of that same mm -hmm. story, and they was the people that was out there. And yeah. uh, and and a lot of times, if they got a non-hunting judge, which we had back then, well, you know, if he tells his story, he don't. He most of the time he don't care to care who wins. So I'd list I'd weigh heavily on what they had to say. Yeah. For sure. Well, I think the trap that a lot of masters of hounds fell into over the years and say, "Well, I got to go with the judge. I got to go with the judge." Well, if it well, was I a wouldn't, non hunting unless yeah. he was totally wrong, and sometimes yeah. they're totally wrong. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, but I, the point I was making is that it can be a crutch. You know, you can say, "Well, rather than for me to try to figure this out and sort all this out, I'll just say I'll go with my judge, and that'll be done with it." But I hope that we didn't do that sort of thing when back in the day as we were trying to build that world championship, and I feel like we really did. You know, my dog, old Hoss, he's really getting on my nerves. He's barking out there, and he knows that he's not supposed to be barking. Like he wants to be on the <laughs> podcast, maybe. I know, and I think he and I are going to have a little discussion when we're through recording. But, uh, well, listen, we've uh, we traveled quite a few miles together, you and me. Uh, it's got to be kind of a habit in the last 10 years. Oh, yeah. And I've enjoyed it for sure. We've met some really nice people. Uh, we traveled up to Autumn Oaks this year, it's, and we've been going to Batesville, Mississippi, and we've been going to the White River, and and now this trip here this weekend, what are we going to do next time? I don't know. We'll figure out something. <laughs> Too young to quit now. That's right. That's right. Well, uh, that's. Uh, I wrote an, a piece in, the, in that book that I published, and it was called Too Old to Quit. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I think that uh, the one thing about this sport right here is we go through phases, and we've talked about it on this podcast before of how, you know, you get into the first phase, you know, as a hunter, you're a kid, you just want to go, you want a gun, you want to shoot things, you want to, you know, 
Well, in, in coon hunting, you want to kill coons. That, that's your objective, you know. And then maybe you get into the competition and you want a dog that can win, you know. And I think a lot of people get where they mess up is that they feel like if they don't win, they, they can't have fun. They don't have a good time. And uh, you go through all of that, but you and I have progressed in this game to the point that we just enjoy being out and being with the hounds. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'd like to listen to a good... Uh, hey, I liked that race we had last night where they cold trailed that coon for a long ways up through there and then back around. Yeah. I, li I like to hear a good cold trailing track like that. Oh, I do too. And I mm -hmm. and it, the Garmin, uh, the GPS allows you kind of to... To look at the screen and see, you know, when the dogs shut up, what are they doing, you know, and, the, and you'd see how they maybe overran, over, overshot it a little bit, and they'd go back and work that. What in rabbit hunting we talk uh, talk about a beagle working the check or a loss from the inside out. In other words, going back to the point where they lost it and working around, you know, and seeing it. And they did that two or three times on that track mm, last did. night. They did. It would have been sweet if they, you know, had finished it with it sitting on the outside there, oh, you yeah. know. But uh, uh, they did what they thought they should do. They certainly didn't grab any trees off that track mm -hmm. until they had about worked it as far as they could work it. And they said, well, the, here, here it is. So, That's right. Well, that uh, was, I, I enjoyed that now. Yeah, well, you, I bet you enjoyed that when Kate fell out of that race. So oh, yeah. And had I, I was glad to see her do that, and then I thought, well, I hope she stays there till we get there, and I figured she would. And then mm -hmm. when we get there, I hope she has a coon, and she did. So. Well, you don't have to worry about her when oh, she's no. treed. She's, oh, she's treed. She's, you know? she's really a nice dog, one of the best dogs I've ever had, I think. And I've had some pretty good ones. Yeah, she is a good dog. And I noticed in White River last fall, uh, she and Cruz splitting, uh, you know, uh, treat, and she doesn't pay attention to what the other dogs are doing. That's for sure. She's got her her mind made up. She's going to stay, and she's pretty accurate too. Oh, yes. that, that means a lot. Oh, she messes some just like any dog, but there's none of them perfect. And, uh, but, well, but she, you know, she's. A, I, I I really like her. Well, how? Do you think our, you know, this thing has changed over the years since you started? What are the the things that you see about coon hunting that are different now? I know the obvious things. We had carbide lights. Now we got a, I think you got a, a new light here the other day, and we yeah. all got the yeah, the I most got, current. I tried. I got me one of them one of them bright eye fusion lights. I think bright. Well, you you gonna melt down the gonna world, melt. aren't you? Yeah, I'm on. Yeah, that's what. That's go Conrad Ray. He says we're gonna have a meltdown. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what uh, you know? How is the the uh, game? We don't call it a game or a sport anymore on this podcast. We like to refer to it as a lifestyle because really. We, we have put our lives into this thing, you and me. Well, I you know, know you got you got better lights and we've got better vehicles, and a lot of us now ride four wheelers or side by sides, and it just makes it easier, especially on an old man like me. And you know, now I got to where I am, getting a little older, and and a lot of times, just like last night, one guy said, "Give me a lease. I'm going to the tree. You stay here." You know, I don't know if it feels sorry for me or what. Well, that is, was me. Don't I get credit for that? <laughs> Not yet. You got to get. <laughs> you got to get a little older. <laughs> no, I, yeah. you know that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went out to the to the uh, Navajo Nation on that mountain lion hunt last month, I had to realize. You know, I said, "Well, I know I can make it up there where those other guys are, but do I want to?" Mm -hmm. Do I want to expend that effort, that energy, or do I want to just stay right here and kind of see what happens? And I find myself more and more falling into that. And I, I think the point is there for uh, the guys out here that are our age uh, uh, that we just need to to do what we can to enjoy the sport as That's long right. as we can. 
Try to make mm-hmm. it fun. That's what it's supposed to be. It's not a job, and it's not something that you want to get mad about all the time. Make it fun. That's what I try to do. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you remember any story, Coe stories that we could tell? Mm-mm, some of them I can't tell. <laughs> We went over this afternoon and spent a little time with uh, our good friend Jamie Perrin and his friend uh, Ricky Dukes and a beautiful hunting uh, lodge and, and all and the property over uh, about, what did we say, 20 minutes? Just 20 minutes. East like of that, us yeah. here. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about some stories and, and while... Uh, you were out touring the. Pro- oh, I don't know. You were outside, but we were talking about Coe Hill. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell tell the listeners about Coe Hill. Who he was. He's got a pretty interesting story. Oh yeah, Coe Hill. Coe Hill would have would have been ninety one a few weeks ago, and uh, he was one of my hunting buddies. But really, Coe Hill had more stories. He could tell more jokes. <laughs> And not tell the same one over twice, you know. He but the co here was a was a. I know Jamie and I was going. What happened to him right in the end? He got a young dog, and I, me and Jamie had decided we. I knew where there was a dog. It was a pretty good coon dog. Jamie and I were going to buy the dog, and give it to Cohill because we knew he didn't need a young dog. He wouldn't have it any other way but to get that young pup. Well, what happened? He got concrete sidewalk. He's got the pup tied on the chain there, and the pup rears up on him, knocks him down, and breaks his hip. Yeah. And that was the end of Coe Hill. He went in the hospital, never came out. He did, but, you know, he got pneumonia from laying there. But uh, yeah. that was well, the end of him. Well, he had quite a story. I mean, he, he was a decorated... Uh, or or what was his military back? He was in the army, and then he got out and stayed in the army reserve for about thirty years. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, but he didn't he have some combat situations or? Uh, yeah, but I, I don't really remember all that okay. he told about that. Yeah, one, but he know. he was definitely a, oh yeah uh, an American hero. Oh yeah, a patriot he was, soldier. He was in there. For, he sp- he stayed thirty or thirty five years right. after his regular time in there uh-huh. and in re- in a, in the in the reserve. I remember in the AKC days when we started the hunt. You and you brought him down. Oh, yeah. He won a gun at the raffle. Yeah. Boy, he was proud of that. Wasn't oh he? yeah, he was proud of that. I remember one story. We were going to the Winter Classic over in Albany, Georgia. So we drove from Birmingham to Phoenix City. And there was a Shoney's breakfast bar place there. And I told Cohill, I said, we need to leave about 6, and then we'll go down there a couple of hours, and we'll stop and eat breakfast. So we go into the place, and Cohill headed toward the bathroom. And uh, this lady that, sir, you know, that greets you and takes you to your table, she said, I said, ma'am, do you see that old man going right there? She said, yeah. I said, that's my daddy. And I said, <laughs> Mama said every time he'd come in a place like this, he was going to steal something. <laughs> and I said, if you'll watch him, I'll either pay for it or make him put it back. So anyway, she said, I'll do that. So we go on. After he comes out, we go get to the table, and we get our little plate, and we're sitting in the booth eating. After about 10 or 15 minutes, he poked me with his elbow, and he said, no, man, you see that woman? And he was pointing under the table. He said, you see that woman standing right over there? And I said, yeah, what about her? And he said, uh, she hadn't took her eye off me since I sat down here. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, go here, she might like you. <laughs> and then a little while I laughed, and he said, what did you tell that blank blank woman? <laughs> so I told him what I told her. He <laughs> he just like he thought that. Tell us about his uh, memorial that you all did for, for uh, him. Cohill wanted to be cremated. And he told me who he had named off six or seven folks that he wanted to go. And he, when he was a kid, a child or a young man, he used to squirrel hunt over around the place that they called Blue Springs. So he said, I want you to take my ashes over there, and I want you to scatter them around, around that Blue Springs. So we was, we, they was just the ones he named off, we went. And so when we got over there, one of his nephews broke out a bottle of whiskey 
and he said Cohill wanted everybody to have one last drink with him before he left. So we we had a little old bottle, and he poured some of that whiskey in him ashes. And that's Cohill's drink. And then he passed the bottle around, and everybody had a drink. And then everybody had a little story to tell about Cohill. And, you know, that's the first time I'd ever done anything like that. But I was, I, that really touched me. I, and, you know, I wouldn't take mm-hmm. nothing for that story. Right. But, yeah. Well, there, there again, you know, we keep preaching this, Chris Powell and I do on this podcast, that it's about the people, the relationships, the lifestyle, and why it's so important to us. It, Yeah, it's about the dogs. We all love dogs. We love to hunt with dogs. We enjoy having a, having good dogs. We enjoy the competition, but even among friends, or my dog treat ahead of your dog or whatever. But, you know, it, it's all about preserving this for the future, preserving this for those that are coming after us, you know, the younger people, um, and uh, that, and trying to get them to understand that it's not all about uh, coon carcasses stacked up on the uh, in the bed of the pickup, or trophies, or money won, or whatever. It's more about preserving that freedom to get out and do things like this. You know, of course, you and I both are retired. Uh, fortunately, you know, I can put money in, I can put gas in a gas tank and get in my truck and drive up here and and spend three days with you and we can hunt and enjoy the dogs and enjoy the company of our, our hosts here who've been just awesome to us this week. And just people need to understand that this lifestyle, it, it's, it's precious to me. It's something I... I've enjoyed my whole life long. I hope to enjoy it for many more years. I know you feel that way too. But we want other people to be able to enjoy it too. And uh, that's why we talk about, you know, knowing your your representatives and your senators and your game officials and, and being uh, law-abiding and and respecting landowners and all those things that we talk about all the time on this podcast all boils down to being able to do what you and I've been doing for the last three days. That's right. Do you think? That's right. And we've got to protect that. We've got to, we've got to act right. Wherever, well, that's wherever. that's a pretty good way to put it, that's Nubbin. Right. We've got to act right. Mm-hmm. And that means, you know, respect, respect for our fellow Hunters, you know, uh, we've viewed some properties here. Uh, we're on this beautiful piece of property here, thousands of acres here. Uh, the, the place that we went over and visited with uh, Ricky and uh, and Jamie uh, today, a beautiful place to hunt, uh, all kinds of different uh, turkey hunt, deer hunt, coon hunt. They were squirrel hunting today. Mm-hmm think they killed four squirrels this morning to their dog and they were going back out this afternoon after we left mm-hmm. all of that lifestyle is on the table all that it takes is politicians with a different mindset to say no more and the people if they don't understand it to say we agree and it's gone, so we gotta we gotta hold on to all that for sure. Well, you know it's been great just sharing this time and talking about some of these old stories. And I'm sure as soon as uh, well, uh, you know the podcast is over, we'll think of a lot more that we wanted to talk about. Can you think of anything? That no, we, we need about to chew? Co- we about covered it. I could well, tell about a lot of the hunts I've been on, but there's no use to going and all that. Everybody got good stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's for sure. And we do want to give a shout out to the friends of this podcast, the people that make it possible. Uh, our good friends always at DU Hunting Supply uh, that uh, provide such great products and customer service. Uh, our friend uh, Nick uh, 
Gilliland with Nightlife Kennel has been a real friend to us. Uh, uh, we uh, give a shout out to our good friend Mark Zepp. Uh, Mark has been supported from the very start. The Freedom Hunters organization that enabled us to go out and uh, put on the hunt for the Marine Tanner, Tanner Bab and uh, and uh, and on and on the list. I'm going to forget some people here, and I know as soon as I'm done. Uh, our Remax uh, Realty uh, with Evan Harrell, who's a strong supporter, and uh, we just uh, enjoy bringing this podcast every month or every week, excuse me. And uh, we just appreciate everybody that's listening, continuing to listen, and we'll try to improve as we go along to bring you what uh, programming that you'll enjoy. I hope you've enjoyed the podcast today as uh, Nubbin and I have had the opportunity to reminisce a little bit. Nubbin, it's time to shut this thing down. We have a uh, saying that we have, and I'm sure that's going to apply here within about an hour when it gets dark and we cut Kate and uh, cruise loose in one of these beautiful uh, Alabama woodlots. And that's uh, when the dogs strike, you follow your hound, but I'll follow mine.